Father, we praise you. We thank you for the privilege and for the opportunity to be in your house, to be with your people. And now regarding this issue of how to effectively, meaningfully reach out to our Muslim community, I pray that you will guide the words and the presentations with your Holy Spirit, that whatever is discussed would bring glory to your name, blessing, and knowledge to your, to your house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In general, I think what is pertinent is for the Adventists to have some basic knowledge of Islam. And in general, what we have noticed, this lack of knowledge has really, really created unnecessary burdens, unnecessary hurdles, and unnecessary misconceptions, okay? What I wanna do is give you some really, really fundamental perspectives in regards to Islam from the actual source that Muslims consider the highest authority, which is their scripture, the Quran. I pronounce it the Arabic way. Some of you asked me today, why are you pronouncing it differently? Because in English, we don't have the sound. We don't have it. So the closest that we come to is the Q. Just so you know, it's the same book. I'm pronouncing it in a different way, so it's not two different books, it's the same book. What I have on the screen is, is a passage that I frequently share with our congregations. It's a very mysterious, and, and it, it goes in chains of, uh, of incidents. It goes through modifications throughout the Quran, but in general, many Muslim scholars are in agreement that at times, Prophet Muhammad was not clear on whether the revelations that he was receiving are they from God or are they from Satan? Now that's being an honest man. His first wife, Khadija, told him, ask God and he will give you a verse. Now, this concept of verse is very critical for Islam because the term or the word Quran or Quran means recitation, okay? So Muslims are extremely fond of reciting passages from the Quran. So in this regard, his first wife told him, ask God who will give you a verse so that you can tell the difference whether this that you're experiencing, the revelations, the visions you're seeing, are they from God or are they from Satan? This is the passage that God gives him. Now this passage, let me give you some, some basics about the Quran or the, the, the scripture of Muslims. This is critical. Because in our interaction with Muslims, if we want to have the attention or at least the, the focus of Muslims on what we are discussing, it is critical for us to consider and give some credence to their scripture, okay? Now many, many uh, Adventists have, have this dilemma. Do we read the Quran? Do we not read the Quran? Is it safe to read the Quran? As if it's like, you know, uh, bottle of cyanide and and you know to them it, it's a major no it's not by no means but if you are looking for the Bible in the Quran you might be disappointed because the Quran has not been written in the stylistic way that the Bible was compiled the Quran does not have chronology it does not follow a timeline it does not follow the narration that we're used to in the Bible. With the exception of the first chapter, the Quran begins with the longest chapter, it goes to the shortest. It is written in the style of the closest that we can come to it are the Psalms in Hebrew, not in English, in Hebrew. Because what we have done when you take the Psalms and translate it into English, you compromise the rhythm you com compromise the rhymes and everything that are involved in the construct. Same thing is in the Quran. The Quran is written to an Arab audience. The Arab audience is extremely poetic, okay? A lot, majority of the literature of Islam are very poetic, all right? So this is what we need to consider. If I'm going to venture into the Quran and trying to get something out of it, brace yourself, you're not gonna be reading 
a biblical style book. Okay? The Quran is not constructed in books, chapters, and verses. It's chapters and verses. Okay? Chapters have number and a name. So in this regard, we are reading chapter 10, which is also called Yunus. Yunus is the Arabic word for Jonah. All right? So Jonah was one of the prophets of Islam, is one of the prophets of Islam. And I will get back, get to that in a bit later. So this passage is taken from chapter 10, which is called Yunus, verses 94 and 95. Okay? So I gave you the background of this, of this passage. The passage is, Muhammad was not clear on the revelations, the messages he was receiving. Are they from God or are they from Satan? This is the message that God gives. Okay? I'll read it and, and we'll expand on it a bit later on. God is speaking to Muhammad. If you are in doubt about what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. The truth has come to you from your Lord. Do not be a doubter, nor shall you be one who rejects the signs of Allah for then you shall be lost. God is telling Muhammad, the way to tell whether your revelations are from me or Satan, ask the people who read the book that was given before your time. And in our, passage, in our seminar or in our uh, sermon today in Phoenix Central, we discussed what is this book that the Quran is talking about? The book it refers to is comprised of three elements. If you read the whole Quran, it describes what the book is. The book is made up of the Torah, Psalms, and the Gospels. So what is the Quran referring to when it says the book? It refers to the Bible. So what we want to do in this section, we want to discover what the Quran says about the Bible. Okay? So you need to know First and foremost, in your interaction with your Muslim community, whether neighbors, co-workers, anywhere, you need to know what their religion or their highest authority, their scripture, has to say about your scripture. Okay? This is where, where pretty much everything is level ground. Anywhere other than this, we are pretty much um, out of alignment. Something's going to give. But we want to start this approach. We want to start this interchange and ultimately relationship on the basis that you know some basics about the religion of Islam. Okay? So first and foremost, we want to know what the Quran says about the Bible. All right? I've selected some passages. Uh, these passages are, I need to refer and I need to remind you, we're going to be reading from the Quran, so I'm not going to be reading from the Bible. So some of these passages, they need to be uh, left alone and just read it for what it's worth in the passage. Here's one problem that you will encounter with your interaction with the Muslim community. Muslims are under the impression, in general, that Christians have corrupted the Bible. So the Bible that we have in our disposal that Bible is corrupted. And in general, they blame the Roman church. Um, in my humble opinion, that is an unfounded argument. For centuries, we have argued with Muslims. For centuries, we have debated, proved, and resorted to every kind of archaeological finding and the parchments and everything has not worked. This issue has been addressed by the Quran in my humble opinion, the most effective way. Look at it here. Look at the first passage on top. Those that have faith and keep from evil shall rejoice both in this world and in the next. The word of Allah cannot be changed. Now, I will get into all these aspects of Islam. Allah, what does it mean? How do we relate to it? Is this the God of the Bible? Is this not the God of the Bible? So we will address it a bit later on. But this passage says, God's word cannot be changed. Why? 
This is the supreme triumph. God shows his triumph over mankind when he protects his word from changing in any way, shape, or form. Look at another passage. And the word of your Lord was fulfilled, a true promise. There is no altering his words. He is all hearing and all knowing. These two passages and the likes of it in the Quran tell Muslims that God's word cannot change, cannot be altered. It is impossible. Why? God is watching over his word. All right? Now, in your interaction with the Muslim community, you might get this feedback. Well, that's true. It's talking about the Quran as not being as infallible, unchangeable. But here's an example right out of the Quran. We gave Moses and Aaron the criterion and the light and remembrance to the godly. What is the Quran saying? God has given Moses and Aaron the criterion. This is another word for the law. For what reason? For light and remembrance to the godly. We revealed the book of remembrance. The book of remembrance in the Quran refers to the book of Deuteronomy. Because it is a book of remembrance. It, it's a book of reminder, right? But notice this passage. And we are its protectors. So according to the Quran, an example of God's word is what Moses wrote. Okay? Again, I, I need to remind us, we are in the context of Islam. Okay? So I'm not in the context of Christianity. I'm in the context of Islam. I have a question. Is this a true statement? We gave Moses and Aaron the law. Is this a biblical statement? It is. Did God give Moses the law? Of course he did. Was Aaron part of it? Of course he was. Okay? So here's, here's part of the prejudice that we're dealing with. When we see truth in the Quran, many of us have apprehension. Do I, do I acknowledge it? Do I not acknowledge it? It can't be because it's out of the Bible. Well, here are some of the prejudice that whether inadvertently or, you know, has built up in our system. So my question is, based on our knowledge of the scriptures, is this statement a true statement? Did this person, and I will discuss what this we is. I'm pretty sure some of you have noticed. What is this we? God is speaking to Muslims in this specific regard. God is speaking to Muhammad. We gave Moses and Aaron the law. Is that a biblical statement? Yes or no? Yes, it is. We are its protectors. So an example of God's word in the Quran is what God gave to Moses and Aaron. All right? Now, do you notice anything peculiar about these two passages? We. This is God speaking to Muslims, and in specific, in this passage, he's talking to Muhammad. We. Is that a singular word, or is that a plural word? Is that consistent with the Bible? Come, let us create man in... That's pretty plural, right? And then immediately after that verse, in verse 27, chapter first, first chapter of Genesis, the Bible says, And in his image he created the male and female. Back and forth between plural and singularity is also common in the Quran. So one of the things we want to understand, instead of rejecting Islam, which most Christians are in the habit of, we need to judge by the book. We need to judge by the Bible. Okay? Does the God of the Bible refer to himself plural and singular? Yes, he does. All right? Can this be helpful in our understanding of Islam? Because what we're seeing in Islam, we're seeing a similar behavior. By the way, throughout the Quran, God calls himself we, us, him, me, his. Same attributes that he's using in the, in the Quran. So what we saw in this passage we're seeing that the Quran says Moses' word is God's word and no one can change it. So based on this statement, how many books did Moses write? Moses wrote technically first five books of the Bible. Technically. Why do I say technically? Because historically we understand that the Babylon invasion destroyed a lot of the scrolls. And from the return of Babylon, Ezra and Nehemiah 
were put in charge of restoring the scriptures and the parchments and the scrolls. How else do we know that Moses did not finish those five books? There's passages in the book of Exodus that says, now Moses was the most humble man on the planet. I don't think Moses wrote that about himself. Okay, so it must have been, you know, one of the, one of the scribes, and technically we know Ezra and Nehemiah finished them. Okay, that's five books from Moses. Moses also wrote, Technically, we know, scholarly we know, he is the top candidate of writing the book of Job. We also know he wrote 10 of the Psalms. So 10 of the Psalms are attributed to Moses. So five books, Job, and 10 of the Psalms. Whatever those that we attribute to Moses, the Quran endorses them as God's word. And no one can change. No one can alter. All right? Let me read some more. Pay close attention. This is exactly for the times that we're living in right now. This passage is from chapter 4, verse 136. O you who believe, believe in Allah and his messenger, Muhammad, and the book he revealed to his messenger, the Quran. Radical Muslims, including ISIS, they close the book at this junction. They close the Quran. And they make a decree. You have to believe in Allah, you have to believe in Muhammad, and you have to believe in the Quran. You don't, you're in danger. And they quote the scriptures. But here's the problem. The Quran does not end here. The passage does not end here. It continues. And the book he revealed beforehand. What is this book? The Bible. The Bible. And whoever, this is speaking to Muslims. Did I remind you? This is speaking to Muslims. Whoever disbelieves in Allah, his angels, his books, plural, his messengers, plural, and the last day, he is the one that has gone astray. He is the one that according to the Quran is kafirun, the word which is translated infidel. Okay, so the Quran is telling 1.7 billion Muslims, they need to believe in Allah, God, and I will discuss it at the end of this slide. They need to revere one prophet or all the prophets. Notice what it says, messengers. Not only the messenger of Islam, but all the messengers that came before. And we'll discover a bit shortly who these messengers are. And the books. So Muslims are told, it's not only Muhammad, but it's all the prophets that came before Muhammad. It's not only the Quran, but all the books that came before the Quran. Including, on top of that, the end time, last day, the angels, the message of the angels. So this is written to Muslims as their command. Would a Christian say amen to this? Would you have a problem? Absolutely not. But what do radical Muslims do? They close the book at this junction and they say, no, it's only Allah, it's only Muhammad, and it's only Quran. Contrary to their book. Extremism, radicalism works the same way all across the board. You take a little passage out of the Bible, twist it, torture it, make it your own, you can make your own religion. Works the same all across the board. In Islam, in Christianity, in Judaism. Hey, did you know automobiles are mentioned in the Bible? Hondas are mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. The Bible says the disciples were all in one accord. That's extremism. That's called radical extremism. You take a passage, you torture it. This is what is being done with radical Muslims. Let me give you a case in point. Last year, a Sharia judge in Pakistan. Now the word Sharia causes a lot of concern in the Western Societies, including America. Sharia basically means the right way. Okay? The law of Sharia, the Sharia law of Islam, 75% of it is based on the law of Moses of the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 75% of the framework of Islamic law is the law of Moses. We'll leave that aside. Last year, a Sharia judge in Pakistan, city of Karachi, 
was in prison for about six months. The local radical Islamic community, the Taliban, had sued him to basically get him off the bench, out of the court, and into prison. What was his charge? His charge was he was the, in the habit of reading this passage at the beginning of every court session. Beginning of every court session, he would read this passage in its entirety. The radical Muslim community did not like what this judge was doing according to the Quran. So what did they do? They sued him, they threatened him, they took him off the bench, they imprisoned him, but then when the time came for his trial, he won his case. He says, I'm acting according to the Quran. If I'm reading the passage, I have to read the whole thing. So Muslims legally, according to the law of Sharia, this is what I need to emphasize, according to the Sharia law, Muslims are obligated to read their book and also the Bible. Not only to follow their book, but also to give credence to the Bible. And I'll give you cases in point. Look at the next passage. Look at the next example. And he, who is this? God. Notice the singularity. And he revealed the book to you in truth. God is speaking to Muhammad. Confirming what is in his hands. He revealed the Torah, which is the Arabic pronunciation of Torah, and the Injil beforehand. What we're doing here, we want to discuss, we want to open up this, this aspect. What does the Quran say about the Bible? What does it have, what does it have to say about the Bible? And no, notice here. He gave the Torah and the Injil beforehand. Injil is the Arabic word for the Gospels. For what reason? Guidance to people. And he revealed the criterion, the law. Those who reject the signs of God. This is speaking to Muslims. Need I remind you, this is not written to Christians. This is to Muslims. But every Christian can say amen to this. Look at here. Those who reject the signs of God, meaning these signs, these revelations, these books, has a strong punishment, and God is strong and avenging. The Quran is telling 1.7 billion Muslims, God has given the Torah, Injil, the Gospels, for them to be lights and guidance. Those who reject these revelations of God will have to deal with God's vengeance. I have a question. Can a Christian concur with this? Yes. Let's look at some more passages. Then we brought Moses the book. Moses' name is mentioned 98 times in the Quran. Jesus' name is mentioned 31 times in the Quran. Muhammad's name is mentioned three times, and all three are in parentheses. Okay? Now look at here. Look at this, what this passage says in chapter 6, verses 154. Then we brought Moses the book, complete for him who does good, an explanation of everything, a guidance and mercy so that they might believe in a meeting with their Lord. This passage in the Quran says, what Moses wrote is complete. It explains everything. What say you? Yeah. Do you have, do, would you object to that? Yeah. Look at the next passage. And we preferred some prophets above others. We brought David a Zabur. Zabur is the Arabic word for the Psalms. The Quran says David is a preferred prophet for Muslims. How do you feel about that? The Quran says David is a preferred prophet and so are the Psalms he wrote. Can Muslims benefit by reading the Psalms? What will they find out if they read the writings of Moses and if they read the writings of David? What will they find out? Talk to me. The biggest of all truths, the pinnacle of all truth, what? The Messiah, right? Now, so far, I have a question. Does the Quran in any way, shape, or form, does it express disdain against the Bible? 
Does it discredit the Bible, in your opinion, from what we have? I'm not done yet. So, does it disrespect the Bible? Does it challenge the Bible? Look at the next passage. We made Isa, son of Maryam. Isa is the Arabic word for Jesus. Maryam is Mary. All right. We made Isa, son of Maryam, follow them, meaning follow the prophets. A confirmer of the Torah in his possession. Did Jesus confirm the Torah? Yes or no? Yes. The Quran says the same thing. And we brought him the Injil. What is the Injil? Gospel. Excellent, your Arabic is improving. <laughs> in which, meaning in the Gospels, is guidance and light, confirming the Torah in his possession, and the guidance and the sermon to the pious. My goodness, this is Quran I'm reading. But you would swear this is the Bible I'm reading, right? So, in this passage, the Quran is saying, Jesus followed the prophets, confirmed the law, and he brought the gospel in which there is light and guidance, but in it also is the sermon to the pious. Which sermon? Whose sermon? Jesus. Okay, so the Quran is referring to the gospels as being essential to Muslims. Right out of their book. Let's look at some more. Now God is speaking to Muhammad. And we inspired you, just as we inspired Noah and the prophets after him. We inspired Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus, Job, Jonah, Aaron, Solomon, David. That's like the entire Bible, <laughs> right? The Quran says to Muslims, just as we inspired Muhammad, we inspired all these prophets. Look at the next one. Those we sent before you, God is speaking to Muhammad, those we sent before you were men to whom we inspired. So ask the people of the Book of Remembrance if you don't know the clear signs and songs. I have a question for you this far. Does the Quran honor the Bible or does it dishonor the Bible? Does it quote the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. Does it refer to the Bible? Yes. Does it refer to the Bible in a challenging way or in a confirming way? Based on what I just shared. All right. Did you notice all these prophets? Islam, the book of Islam, Quran, has 25 prophets. Muslims have 25 prophets. 24 are out of the Bible. They're from the Bible. What percentage is that? 96%. 96% of the prophets of Islam are your prophets. You want to see it for yourself? Here it is. These are the English pronunciation, Spanish, and this is the Arabic for those of you who can read and write Arabic. I'll read the list of the prophets of Islam, and then I'll ask you a question. These are the prophets of Islam. Adam, Enoch, Noah, Heber, Methuselah, Abraham, Lot, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Jethro, Moses, Aaron, Ezekiel, David, Solomon, Elias, Elisha, Jonah, Zechariah, John the Baptist, Jesus. If I stop there, what religion am I describing? One more. Muhammad, what have Christians done? They've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. But wait a minute, 24 out of the 25 revered prophets of Islam are our prophets. Do you want to know what the Quran says about Jesus? Here is what it says about Jesus. Now, before, before we get the last slide going, don't read the last slide. Um, Focus on the question that I'm going to ask. Question number one. Does the Quran conflict with the Bible? Does it respect the Bible? Does it honor the Bible? Does the Quran honor the prophets of the Bible? Does it confirm the fact that they were inspired? Now let's see what it says, what the Quran says about Jesus. 
This is what it's, the, the beliefs in the Quran about Jesus. These are the verses. S means surah. It's an Arabic word for chapter. Remember, I said the Quran is made up of chapters and verses, surah and ayah. So it's chapters and verses. These are all the verses and the chapters that say these. And these are all the corresponding verses from the New Testament confirming these. Okay? So what you see on the screen is a biblical confirmed statement regarding Jesus and the religion of Islam. This is what Islam, this is what the Quran says about Jesus. Jesus is son of Mary. He is the Messiah, servant of God, prophet, apostle of God, word of God, word of truth, spirit of God. He's a witness, mercy from God, sign for all people. He is great. He is righteous, meaning without sin. He is holy. He's blessed. He gives life. He did miracles, was led by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, guides people the truth, healed people, raised the dead, would die for unbelievers, resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven, is coming again. If I didn't tell you I'm quoting the Quran, you would say, where am I quoting from? Would a Christian have conflict with what I just read about Jesus? Okay, so my question is, does the Quran honor or respect the Bible, yes or no? Does the Quran respect the prophets of the Bible? Does the Quran respect Jesus? So what is our problem? So let me ask you another question. How many of you knew this before this? One person, two person. How many of you, this is the first time you're seeing it and hearing it? Okay, so my question is, what do you think? Are we enemies? Or are we closer than we thought? Okay. So what is the problem? The problem is most Christians don't know this. Most Muslims don't know it. Why do I say Muslims? Here's the problem. With the exception of maybe 18%, the majority of the world of Islam does not come from Arabic-speaking background. And since Islam is in Arabic, in other words, everything conducted in the religion of Islam is in Arabic, many, many Muslims end up learning the religion basically by what they remember learning, mimicking from childhood. Okay? And most Muslims are under the impression that unless we do things in Arabic, otherwise it won't count as acceptable to God. Does this remind us of our history? Unless you do things in Latin, God is not going to hear. In fact, you will be punished. In fact, you will be burned at the stake. Okay? History is repeating itself. All right? In this regard, one of the questions we have to ask. As Seventh-day Adventists, as those who have been identified as the people of the book by the Muslim community, we have to ask ourselves the question, have we treated our fellow Muslims according to the word or no? We haven't. What have we done? How have we treated them? According to rhetoric. According to what comes down the pike in media, mainstream media, what goes on in the realm of politics, how things have been perceived, especially in the last 15, 16 years since September 11, and all this pretty much is how an Adventist has shaped their worldview about Islam. Uh, the last time that I was traveling to the Middle East, I was getting on my plane in LAX and you know you're done with TSA and all that and now you're at the gate you're about to enter so as I was about to enter my flight I heard my name called they couldn't pronounce my last name either so they were struggling with the last name I, kn I know that this is an official so they're calling 
uh, Gerald, 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 we need to talk to you. And so I turn around as the people are walking into the funnel. I looked around and there's two friendly Homeland Security agents <laughs> with the badges and the guns and everything. Can we have a few minutes with you? Sure. So they pulled me out of line. One went through my um, briefcase, which had my computer. The other one went through my, my phone, and they asked for my passwords, and I gave them the passwords, and these two guys went at it. I mean, they're just pulling out everything in my phone and in my, in my computer, and they're asking a whole bunch of questions. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Why are you going now? Why did this country, you know, who are these people that you know? And all this stuff. So about 20 minutes or so, I'm leaning on the wall, glass wall looking at the plane because it's 20 minutes late. And so they looked at me and said, don't worry about it. The plane will be here. The plane will be here. Don't worry about it. You'll be on the plane. So after about 20 minutes or so, they realized um, I'm not a terrorist. So one of the agents, he had my cell phone. This, let's pretend this is my cell phone. Um, he said, let me see if I get this right. You're going to the Middle East to talk about Jesus to Muslims? I said, that's what I do, yes. He kind of looked at his partner. He gave me my phone and he said, good job, man, good job, do it. We won't bother you when you come back, good job. <laughs> Even the Homeland Security knows bombing, warfare is not the answer. It's the gospel. That is the answer. Okay, so what we have discovered in a very condensed, very brief, very crash style, we need to know that our Muslim neighbors, that our Muslim co-workers, that our Muslim community where we live is not the enemy. Can anybody say amen? amen. They're not the enemy. And we have been identified, have been perceived by them as the very people that have been prophesied in their book. And I read the passage for you. When you're in doubt, talk to the people of the book. As many Muslims as I remember when they come across, when they, when they get acquainted with us Adventists, one of the first early reactions, responses is, you're different from the rest of Christians. And as soon as they realize what we do, our habits, you know, this just a little brief exposure, they say, you're not Christian. You don't eat pork. You don't drink alcohol. You're not Christian. You've got to be Muslim. So one man says, you're a Muslim, except you're a little better than us because you don't smoke. <laughs> the question remains, what do we do with this information? What do we do? Now, I said the challenge that many Muslims deal with is the issue of the hindrance of the language. Some time ago, I had lunch with uh, some Muslim leaders, and the lady that was sitting across the table from me, she was a diplomat from Indonesia. Very pleasant lady, very elegant. I mean, it, she was a joy to be around. We talked, we interacted and all, and then she said that I'm on a plane almost every day. So I said, then in that case, how do you pray five times a day? Because Muslims, devout Muslims are supposed to play f pray five times a day. She kind of, you know, she was a little shy, and then she said, I can't pray five times a day. Three is the maximum that I can do if I can. And I said, okay, what language do you do your supplications and dua and your prayer? She said, in Arabic, of course. I said, do you speak Arabic? Do you read and write Arabic? No. The issue was, she practices her religion without technically understanding what's there. We can relate to that very strongly. So one of the things that is pretty much on the shoulders of the Advent folk, is that first of all, we need to know our book. 
And the reading of our book is not as popular as it was 20 years ago because Bible reading is down in the Adventist church by 40%. Okay? Uh, that is a very painful realization. 40% of us read the Bible less what they did 20 years ago. Now, if you take the Bible out of the equation, do you think that void will remain void or something else fills it in? Something else fills it in, whether we like it or not. And what is it that fills it in? World. Not the word, but the world. Okay? Now, too much of the world has caused us to stay away from Muslims. I was in one of our churches in Northern California in the city of Hayward. Our church is side by side to the mosque. It's a huge edifice. It's a cathedral looking mosque. Very beautiful. Next to our church. And the pastor, senior pastor of our church, he's retired now, but Pastor Paul Penno, he called our ministry and he said, would you come and help us in getting acquainted with the mosque next door? When he said next door, I had no idea that it literally meant next door. On, in fact, on Sabbath days, if you're a visitor to the church, many visitors, by mistake, they drive up to the parking lot of the mosque. And the mosque folk are okay with that, so you can leave it there. <laughs> this was two days after the San Bernardino shootings. Remember the San Bernardino shootings? 13 people got killed. Almost 30 people got injured. Two of them, Seventh-day Adventists, okay, that worked for the facility. Now, this is two days after the shootings um, at this, our, in our church. I did a presentation in the morning. At lunchtime, the pastor came up to me and he said, let's go over to the mosque. Let's walk over to the mosque. I want to introduce ourselves. Okay, we walked to the mosque. The receptionist, very sweet lady, you know, she was a young lady covered with hijab and the covers. She said, normally the imam is not here on Saturdays, but he's here today. Hallelujah. So we stood. He came out a minute later, very respectful Pakistani individual. He shook our hands and he said, brothers, what can I do for you? I didn't waste any time. I said, my name is so-and-so. I'm visiting from Los Angeles, and this is our senior pastor, church next door. We are the people of the book that the Quran has talked about. Go ahead, call me Aragon. It's fine with you. <laughs> he looked at us. He thought for a few seconds. Then he shook our hands again, and he said, I apologize for what my people did in San Bernardino. Not only they were not Muslim, they were not human beings. He said, as a result of what happened, I have many questions, and I don't have the answers. My congregation, every time I say this, I get goosebumps. He said, my congregation has many questions. Can we come to your church and dialogue with your church for the answers? What is going on? You should have seen the look on our pastor's face. You look like a kid in a candy store. Of course, of course. So we greeted each other. We are walking back to the church. As we were walking back to the church, our pastor punched me on my shoulder and he says, wait a minute. Is that all it took? That's all it took. Tell them. We are the Ahl al-Kitab, and this is what I'm going to suggest to Pathway to Health Committee. Uh, I, I, spoke with, I spoke with Benny, is that, I'm not sure if it was Benny, uh, and also to Dr. Lewis. I'm recommending the flyers and the handouts that you will prepare for the community. Let us design and let us word and text in specific to the Muslim community, okay? It is very, very critical that we're sensitive to what resonates with the Muslim community. And one of the things that I strongly recommend, last week I was in Canada, and we were doing this series in Canada, and I had recommended to our pastors, 
I said, if you want Muslim community to take you serious, first of all, you have to be visible to them. Second, don't be bashful. Tell them who you are because they have been told. In times of confusion and doubt, talk to the people of the book. If you are the people of the book, you need to be visible and accessible to this community. And I get there from, you know, when I got to Canada, when I'm walking, when I'm driving to the church, I saw this big old neon signs that we have, you know, with the writings and all that. It said, come worship with the people of the book. Come worship with the people. We've had Muslim imams, meaning pastors of the masjids or the congregations, to come and sit in our meetings in Adventist churches. The last encounter that I had was in Atlanta two months ago. A local mosque imam from Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, came to our church, Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church. He sat on the front row, and after two hours of the presentation, they had microphones on the front for people, for the folks to ask their questions. This imam got up, he came to the, mo he came to the microphone, and he said, I don't have a question, I have a statement. I want to compliment you for an excellent presentation. He said, this needs to be heard in our mosques. He says, I'm a Muslim imam, and I had no idea who he was. I had no idea he was sitting there. He said, I just want to tell you, I want to congratulate you. This is not what we hear. This is, I had no idea what I was going to hear in this church. He says, the only downside, the only negative is, I missed the first half hour. I kick myself for missing the ha first half hour. I'm hoping they will give me a recording of, of the program. Muslims have been in our presentations and they concur and affirm what they hear. So please, I beg of you, you need to be visible to the Muslim community simply by telling them we are the people of the book. And if you want to learn it a little bit, you want to take it up a step further, you can learn it in Arabic. Okay, well, you, hey, you guys in the mood of learning some new language? Okay, first of all, we need to learn the greeting. Repeat after me. Assalam. Don't hesitate, come on. Assalam. Let's hear it again. Assalam. Assalamu alaikum. Now, Muslims will always greet you back with reversing it. So they're going to say, Alaikum assalam. And if you lose, which way should I be? Wh am I responding on the receiving end? Always be the first to initiate it. <laughs> okay? So always say what? Assalamu Now, just so you know how this is all tied in to God's people, in Hebrew, this very term in Hebrew is Shalom Alechem. Shalom Alechem. How far is it from Salam Alekum? This is the same root. And the Aramaic is Shlama Alochun. You see, all these come from the same root. Now I want to describe to you the word Allah, as I said at the beginning. Many Christians, including Adventists, have this dilemma. Is Allah the God of the Muslims? Is He our God? Is He the God of the Bible? Is He not the God of the Bible? If He is, how do we know? If He's not, how do we know? And so this has been a very, in my humble opinion, our response to this question will determine what kind of friendship, what kind of association we will have with the Muslim community. Notice I'm very careful. I'm not using the word evangelizing. I'm not using the word conversion. Okay? In fact, I have, well, let me, let me go through this first process and I will tell you, uh, you know, what, what my experience is and how I, and along with the team, along with my colleagues, we conduct this ministry. Allah is the word that Muslims use for God. But let me break it down a little bit. Because Islam is a very culturally and linguistically a very diverse religion, the pronunciation, the correct pronunciation, the Arabic root pronunciation of God's name in Arabic is Allah. Allah. Do you know what is the word for God in Aramaic? Allah. Allah. 
Allah, Allah. Tell me, how different is this? Okay. Your brothers and sisters of Indonesian descent, Loma Linda, New York, Austin, Texas, you know what word they're using for God in their worship services? Allah. You know when you have your song service, all the, you have the words on the screen, you know what words Indonesian Adventists are using? Allah. Okay? What Muslims are using is the most basic root name of God. What is the most simplest prefix name of God in the Bible? El. El, right? El is Hebrew. Al is Aramaic. Al is Arabic. Okay? Ha is the root prefix or the life attribute of God's name in the Bible. That life, chaya in Hebrew, is attributed to God with the pronunciation of ha. When Abram was blessed, he became Abraham. When Sarah was blessed, she became Sarah, right? Ha, chaya, it's God's life attribute that he blesses with, that gives life to inanimate subject. Muslims are using the most basic name of God, Allah. Whereas we Christians, <coughs> I don't want to split hair, I'm not into that. I just want to help as much as I can to dissolve prejudice, all right? We Christians are using the word G-O-D, which we adapted and adopted from the Nordics of the 6th and 7th century. Their pagan gods were Gos and Got. Germans are still using Got, G-O-T-T, -T, for God. We adopted a pagan name for the Creator, and we're pointing the fingers at Muslims that are using the biblical name of the Creator. What has affected us the most, in my humble opinion, because they look different, because they dress different, because they smell different, they talk different, they sound different, then something's got to be wrong with them. You see, what has, in my humble opinion, what has transpired is all these voids and all these fractions that we are dealing with they have nothing to do with the religion. It has to do with where our perception, their perception. In the mind of an average Christian, a Muslim, am I, can I be honest with you? Or should I be politically correct? In the eyes and the minds and the ears of an average Christian, a Muslim is here to overtake America. They are dangerous. There have got to be suicide bombers among them. They're beheaders, and this, that, and all that. Am I right? Yes, you're right. In the mind of an average Muslim, a Christian is pork eater, mm -hmm. beer drinker, mm -hmm. Las Vegas worshiper, mm -hmm. Hollywood, mm -hmm. idolater, mm -hmm. immoral, hanky-panky outside of marriage. All this is in the mind of Muslims. You want to talk to Muslims? Once you become friends, this is what you hear from Muslims. This is what we think of you guys. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Okay, now, is it true? If someone says, you Adventist, blah, 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 this. You eat pork? No, we don't. Well, some do, I have to admit. I was, I was in a very, very large Adventist church last year. I had to preach four services, back to back. In between the services, there were Sabbath school classes. So between the first session and the second session, I asked one of the pastors, I said, could you lead me to a, you know, a Sabbath school discussion. I want to go to, to sit in some of the Sabbath schools. So he took me and he led me to this big old round table. There was about 20 people around the table. He said, I think you would like the Sabbath school. Okay. I sat and all the conversation went dead. Well, the Sabbath school teacher said, thanks for joining us, Pastor. We were discussing and analyzing your sermon. <laughs> I said, I won't talk. I said, I'll behave. I'm just sitting. I want to hear it. 
So I sat there. I kid you not. The Sabbath school teacher said, I have an issue with what you said this morning. I don't see anything wrong by eating bacon with my breakfast every Sunday morning. So I had to hear the whole um, synopsis. He said, I don't see anything wrong. We're saved by grace. As, you know, as if he had like an epiphany, you know. Right. I said, you know, my, my brother, I said, I'm not going to split hair with you. I'm not going to talk theology. I'm just going to talk to you common sense. I said, 1.7 billion Muslims will listen to the gospel from people who eat halal, clean. The number one reason they are rejecting the gospel because they're calling us, you infidel, defiled, swine eaters. You have come to us to tell us what the right way is. You yourselves have lost your way. Look at how you guys are living. I said, if there was a time in history, now is not the time to pick on pig eating and, and you know, pork eating. <laughs> I said, plus, let me ask you a question. Isn't there enough clean meat out there? Why do you have to eat the junk of the junk? That took up the whole session. <laughs> but my question is, has God uniquely endowed this movement? Amen. Whereas most Christians do not understand. And I'll be honest with you, most Adventists do not understand. Why is it that we don't eat unclean? We always attribute it to, well, because the Bible says it and we don't. Know. Here's one more. We do this. We don't eat pork. We don't defile our bodies. We don't consume alcohol. We don't go into that, not because we want to be different, but because we are submitted to God. Amen. God's word hasn't changed, and we have submitted ourselves to that word. Amen. Do you know what is the word for submission in Arabic? Islam. So I have a question for you. Some of you are like, you're... you're you're dangerous, man. I mean, you're putting us in this. I have a question. Are you surrendered? Almost. <laughs> well, let me rephrase the question. Do we need to surrender? Yes. Does God want surrender? Yes. And what happens when you surrender? You're a Muslim. We're hung up on names. We're hung up on titles. We're hung up on church, you know, terminologies. And we shoot ourselves in the foot. Let me give you another example. In this regard. The word Allah in Arabic is pronounced Allah. And it's rooted in Aramaic, which is rooted in Hebrew, which is rooted in the language of the nation of Israel, including Father Abraham. The word for God in Spanish. Do we have Spanish speakers here? Mm -hmm. What is the word for God? Dios, Dios right? Yeah. You know where that came from? As you can tell, I'm into languages. You know where that came from? Mm -hmm. It came from Zeus. Mm -hmm. Zeus, 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 Dios. I don't see anybody pointing fingers at the Spanish speakers, right? This is all linguistics, not theological linguistics. Do Muslims perceive God the same way you and I do? No. This is where the issue needs to be focused on. It is not that they're worshiping a demon, as some Adventists have told me. It is not that they're worshiping a moon god or some black rock that fell and it's at the corner of Mecca. No, you talk to any Muslim who is, just two weeks ago, prior to Canada, I was in Russia. In our audience, we had seven Muslim Tajikis that were at the seminary. Tajikistan, you know, it's one of the republics, former Republic of so Soviet Union, they're all Muslims. They're sitting in, our, in the audience and 
I was told by one of our colleagues that there's going to be Muslims in the audience. I said, I'm not going to change a single thing because I've been with Muslims and I know what I'm to them. During my conversation, I turned to one of the Tajiks and I said, in Russian, it, obviously where the conversation was in Russian. I'm not fluent in Russian, but I asked him, tell me who is Allah. And he got up and he said, the Creator, the Almighty, the Father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Ishmael, the God of Esau. He is the Almighty, the beginning, no end. He is the everlasting one. I said, stop. I said to the audience, is this your God or not your God? See, one of the things we have to remember, some of the issues are linguistics and have nothing to do with theological. However, however, yes, they perceive him differently. What do they need for them to understand the full character of God? How can anyone, anyone discover the full character of God? Christ, right? How will that happen? Can you by now share enough with Muslims about Jesus so that they will see the clear picture of God, salvation, the plan of salvation, yes or no? Do they know enough about Jesus? Okay, so my question is, can you share, I'll pick one, whoever, any volunteers? Any volunteers, any brave hearts that want to be get caught on camera? I have a question. Can we share the plan of salvation with Muslims based on what they know about Jesus? Which would you use? Which one of these attributes would you use? Guides people to truth. I probably have to take it as a whole because you wouldn't want to take any one thing out of context. Very smart. But if you were to narrow it down, which one could be He's shared? Righteous. Very good. Jesus is righteous. Jesus is very good. Jesus is, anybody else? Messiah. Messiah. Excellent. Jesus is? Every one of these you can use to share the plan of salvation with your Muslim friends. Every one of them. Limitations are? We Adventists have a propensity. We like to dump the whole truck on people on that first opportunity we get. We start from Garden of Eden, we take them all the way to 666. What was the Lord's way? Tell me stories. Come on now. Parables. Mingled with the people. He ministered to them in their time of need, like you will do in December, in a very grand way. Establish trust, then you would say, follow. But we have a fast food mentality. Even some of, one of the famous icons of this country is called Mount Rushmore, you know? We rush. We want to get those heads under water. They need to be bathed. We need to have the names in the books. Hey, I'm talking to a lot of leaders. They know where I come from. You know, one, one of our leaders said, Brother Gerald, when, at what point do we consider these guys? He said, these guys as Adventists. I knew where he was going to, but I kind of played it. And I said, what do you exactly do you mean? He said, well, brother, when do we have their names in our books? When do we collect tithe? I said, my brother, if you mean the books that say 1,200 members and only 130 show up on a Sabbath session, yeah. I said, if you're talking about those books, I don't care if their name ends up in that book. I care more for their name to end up in his book, yeah. where that is the clear exact account okay what I'm trying to say if we want to approach this sector this community with a typical Adventist mindset and mentality I beg of you don't even take the first step forget that I was even here are you willing to become friends for the sake of friendship Amen. Amen. 
Are you willing to minister without anticipation of any form of reciprocation? Okay, I will. Okay, I believe. Is that, if that is it, don't take that step. I'm sorry, but that does not work with anybody nowadays. Okay, so one of the things we want to consider is this. This is a deep, profound approach to the Muslim community. The Muslim community is very spiritual. They practice their religion. And Islam is a very black and white religion to its adherents. They call sin, sin in the morning. They call the same thing sin at night. They don't change their way along the way. They don't change their stand along the way. Respect that. Engage that. Embrace that. And one of the things that I have in conclusion in this, in this section do we have enough to work with, with our Muslim community? Wouldn't you consider this miraculous? God has gone before us, way before us. In his eternal wisdom, he made sure that his footprints are all over this religion. All he wants us to do, not to reinvent the wheel. We're not here to reinvent the wheel. We're here to facilitate the journey of a Muslim to their book, which leads to the Bible, which leads to eternal life. Amen. We accomplish this, our job is done. That takes a complete different paradigm. That takes a complete different mindset. Are there any questions? Let me see how we're doing on time. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Let's say 15 minutes for questions. Well, I was just saying, I work in the medical community in a hospital, and I work around a lot of different cultures, Hindu and Muslims and things like that. Um, the question I have is... Maybe I can help the last statement I made. Um, do we have plenty to go with in sharing the plan of salvation with Muslims? Be friends with them? Make them friends. That's okay. That's okay. You'll come to it. You'll come to it. Question. I'm a Catholic, and I work with... Muslims, but I do French and evangelism, and it works. Amen. And uh, I've had a Muslim ask me, what's wrong with you? Did you I tell said, him? Yeah. Did you tell him what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> I told him I love Jesus, and he, he accepted that. Next time you said, I'm the people of the book. But I didn't know that. That was didn't. fantastic. Now, you now my, my question is, one of my jobs is to console uh, people, when somebody in a family dies. How do I do that to a Muslim? How do you do it in terms of like the service yeah. or the con the condolences and, and the con the counseling and? Okay. I mean to console. How do you express yourself, right? Yeah. Okay. See, here's the point. This is, in my humble opinion, where Adventism can shine. This is one of the points. All right. Muslims come, and by the way. Can I help also with something that I think will really contribute to your sensitivity? The pronunciation is not Muslim. It's Muslim. It's S. It's S. Why do I say this? Muslim means tyrant in Arabic. Muslim means the one who has surrendered, submitted. Okay? So train yourself to pronounce it with an S, which shows sensitivity on our part to them. Now. In terms of the issue of death, the whole idea is that Islam has a very, very adamant concentration on the issue of the judgment day. Muslims, by and large, have a, a fear slash apprehension slash anxiety looming over their head regarding the book, The Day of Judgment. Now, why do I say this? This is why so much of Islam is geared towards... Now, here's... This is fresh, I would say, about a month old. I was listening to a lecture of a woman Muslim scholar. She said, a Muslim will lose his status as a Muslim not 
by committing the heinous crimes, not committing sin, not even if he or she commits murder. You lose your status with God if you do not pray five times a day. Now you see the intention of a five-time prayer on a daily basis. It becomes a what? Pretty soon it becomes a chore. It becomes torture. It becomes, oh, no, I, got, no, I didn't do five times. Uh, I did four times. Now can I do six times tomorrow? You see, the whole point of it is the Quran doesn't support that. The Quran says God doesn't want. Now I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you. God does not care for the sacrifices. He cares for the niyyah. He cares for the intention. Does that come from the Bible? Yes. You see what I'm saying? What happens? A Muslim, when they hear a consolation from their own book, has more weight on it, right? But here's what you want to do. The whole issue of fear being mingled with the Day of Judgment for Muslims brings them to this fact that they will resort to a whole host of things to console themselves after the death of a loved one. This is where, in my humble opinion, the influence of Catholicism has crept in through the centuries, especially in Shia Islam. I'll have, this is a different segment, but in Shia Islam, this is why there's such animosity between Sunnis and the Shiites, because radical groups like ISIS, they call Shiites dead worshipers, saint worshipers. Where did saint worship come from? Not from the Bible, where did it come from? From the Roman church. So the association, the close association of Shia Muslims with the, with the Roman church has brought this paradigm into Shia Islam that the dead can be appeased as long as the survivors do their part diligently. Pay, go pay homage to Mecca for their sake or give alms and you know, helps to the poor or offer sacrifices and all on behalf of the dead. You see what happens when you take the, the element of the scriptures out of the picture? Fear, ultimately fear fills the void. So one of the things I would recommend to you as a chaplain, remind them, God is a just God. God is a fair judge and this judge is more than anything else. He is loving, he is merciful. Instead of being caught up in what do we do now on behalf of the dead one, give them this assurance. This is where you come in as an Adventist chaplain. The dead know nothing. Well, where does that come from? It comes from Zabur. Wait a minute. Zabur is, is Quran. That's right. Instead of me saying it comes from the Psalms, I just used an Arabic word. That is Psalms in Arabic, Zabur. Who wrote the Zabur? David. How do I pronounce David in Arabic? Dawood. Dawood. So what do I do? I brought the message of the Bible in the context that a Muslim can understand. You would say Prophet Dawood in the Zabur says the dead know nothing. But it's in the Bible. But it's God's word. And it cannot be changed. Now, as a token of my appreciation of you being here, I will give you a copy of this file. Um, however, I don't, I'm not comfortable in print. So if you have thumb drives, if you're part of the church or someone can give me a thumb drive, I'll load it up to you, give it to you, and whoever was here at this meeting, you're more than welcome to give that individual a thumb drive so you can have the whole file on it. You're going to have way more than what I've covered on your file. So... Did you remember a question? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Say it, say it now. So anyway, I work in the medical community and I work with physicians, but we also um, have hosted many foreign exchange things. One of them was from Kyrgyzstan, a Muslim, didn't eat pork, yes. and he went through a revelation seminar. Wow. And Praise he God. was given a big family Bible. I mean, that he wanted. He was so excited. Sure. But we saw What language? Uh, Kyrgyzstan? The Bible. Oh, the Bible's English. English. Okay. English. But anyway. He basically, we saw him change. I mean, he lived with us for six months, and he was going to live with wow. us a year. We Here. saw him flip after rapid. Here, the, in the States. In the States. We lived in Oregon at that okay. time. Okay. Um, but me as a Seventh-day Adventist, and he knew we worship on Sabbath. He knew we didn't eat pork, and so he, and he, he accepted going to church on Sabbath, even though 
he worshiped different. But I don't know if he was strong, but what I'm saying is that after he got the Bible, he was so excited, then also he changed. As a Christian, as a Seventh day Adventist, how can I witness? Not only, Good. of course, we've lost touch with him. Very close. Um, but I'm still in touch with, I have a, a, a physician that's yeah. Pakistani, and, yeah. and I think he's Muslim. Yeah. How do I witness? How do I share? I mean, your My, message is great, but how do I My short term response. Go on our website, asureharvest.com. You have a card. I don't have, I'm, I'm out of my cards, um, but, huh? So let me, let me pull up one of the files. Let me put it on the screen, okay. if you give me a second. Sure, sure, sure. Let me, let me, you don't know how many times we're, I've heard this statement. That's why we want to make sure everything that we do here stays here with you guys. So I'm not going to take anything with me. So um, our address is here. We have two websites. One is for Farsi, Arabic, and Turkish language speakers. Ahdejadid.com. www. Sorry, every time I turn it into yellow, it saves in blue for some reason. I don't know. I think it becomes active because it picks up Wi-Fi. I think that's the one. So Ahde, A-H-D-E-J-E-D-E-E-D.com. This is for Farsi, Arabic, and Turkish speakers. Okay? The other. Huh? What's the spelling of the first? Up there under the sun. A H D E J A D E E D. Ahd Jadid, which means New Testament.com. This is one of our websites. Then the other one that I think most of you can also use is the English one, asureharvest.com. Click on study. You have 40 study guides designed for Adventists and how to share the gospel with Muslims. How to know about Islam at the comfort of your home. And also how you can refer this to your Muslim friend without endangering him, without ostracizing him in any shape or form. Now, I'll tell you what happened with your Muslim friend. 99%. This whole notion that Bible is corrupt caught up with him by his surrounding. Okay? Most Muslims that do make a decision for the gospel, they do become ostracized if they do it openly. Okay? So my recommendation would be, if you want to give them anything, if you want to give them any resources, give them resources that they can relate to. All right? What we have there are the study guides that use the Bible and the Quran side by side. And the Quran passages are in Arabic, so they know this is authentic. This is authentic. So what you want to do is do not, and, and here's another thing you do. Like I said, we Adventists have this propensity. We want to dump the whole truck, right? Let's be realistic. A little bit at a time will require your continued friendship. Am I right? Yeah. But once we give the whole package, that means, assalamu alaikum, have a nice flight. This is our mentality. We want to keep that, all the channels open. And the way you keep them open, you share a little bit, and you're there for the next one. And you're there if there are questions. You know what I'm saying? So. So one of the things I would strongly recommend, act like the people of the book. The people of the book are told, when you're in doubt and confusion, talk to the people of the book. So that means we have to be accessible. Okay, so next time, a little bit, but a very focused little bit. So we have the 40 study guides. Go through them yourself. Read them, see what you guys think, Many pastors have helped us to, to put this all together. Then when you're confident, do you know what it's all about? I think I'll give this one to him, or I give this one, or don't give him anything. Send him a link, check this out. That's it, that's it. You know, a little nudge. This is, this is what we have to be very careful. You know, we are in this for the long haul. The long haul, in, by and large, is a little foreign to many of us Adventists. You know what I'm saying? So, question.
Most likely. Most likely. Uh -huh. And um, they all believe, I believe, that the gamut, the white gamut, the ones that are very involved in, in their religion, the ones that are not so involved. But I did know that they all believe in parts of the Bible. Um, but all of them believe in Jesus, obviously as a prophet and not as a savior. So how, if they believe in so much that we do, how do we get them to make that connection with Jesus as Savior? That's where you come into the picture. They have that without us. Where do we come into the picture? This is what I said. What we know about Jesus. Is the Quran mention Jesus as being Savior? Is no, here's, here's, here's what I shared with you. That's why that, I was very emphatic in my question. What we had on the screen about the beliefs about Jesus. Let me put this on. My question was, do they know enough about Jesus on this list for them to experience the plan of salvation? See, again, I want to practice what I preach. I don't want to dump the whole truck on this session. You see what I'm saying? But I'll give you a case in point, just so you know how things work. This is why, this is why, we need to get back to the scriptures as if our lives depend on it. Amen. You know, and, and this is what I asked at the beginning. I said, I'm going I'm to have a biblical perspective on this. Which one would you guys have? Because if I had shared the biblical perspective, we wouldn't have been able to cover what I've covered. Mm -hmm. That's why I had to ask you. But according to the scriptures, if we follow the scriptures, we realize one thing. The promise that the Lord made to Hagar regarding making Ishmael great, mm -hmm. he has kept his promise. Amen. How he did keep his promise? By the figure, the central figure of Islam, Muhammad, who was a direct descendant through Abdul Muttalib to Ishmael. Through Muhammad's time, that huge promise, the promise that he made, remember this morning, the word Gadol? Gadol means great, mighty, large, numerous in number, loud, significant. Does that fit Islam? Mm -hmm. The Lord that promised, who is the Lord in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord? Jesus himself. He has kept his promise. He wants us to see that he's a promise-keeping God, even to the descendants of Ishmael. They need to hear this from us. Exactly. So what, one of the things we have to remember is this. The acceptance, I'll give you a case in point. I was in Seattle, maybe about seven months ago, this year. At the presentation time in the afternoon, the training time, the similar what we are doing now, when the question and answer was up, time came a gentleman in the back seat raised his hand he got up I, I could tell he's not American because he has all the complexions of a Middle Eastern and so forth he got up and he said I don't have a question I just want to share something with with your audience he said I'm a Shia Muslim from Lebanon later on I find out he's a big-time real estate broker for Seattle area <laughs> he said whatever I've been hearing today our mosques need to tell this to our Muslim brothers and sisters because everything you said is from the Quran. You didn't say anything outside of the Quran. He said, second, I go to mosque every Friday. I'm a devout prayer five times a day. I go to Mecca at least once a year. And I believe in the divinity of Christ. I believe that Jesus, Esau, is God in the flesh, God in human flesh. And everybody just stared at him. You know, they, they didn't know how to respond, you know. And he said, I came to this conclusion not by arguing with Christians, but by reading the Quran. Can we do that? Can we facilitate that journey? Here's one of the things I can recommend. Every one of these can be the platform by which they can understand that Jesus is not merely a human a noble human, an excellent prophet, but also God in the flesh. Because the Bible says that is the condition that they have to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Am I right? Every one of these is capable of doing it. Are we willing to spend the time with a Muslim explaining the concept of Messiah, servant of God, word of God? My goodness, they say he is the spirit of God. How can he be the Spirit of God and not be God? And all this, the time that we will invest in this friendship, 
it will hone your skills and it will sharpen their understanding Amen. and understanding. And, and please, don't dump your truck huh? right, right. On, on any occasion, right, right. let alone the first occasion. Right. Can we have a word of prayer? Amen. Thank you so much. Father, we praise you, we honor you, because you deserve it all. And we want to thank you for this wonderful time that we've had, this interaction, and for the interest and for your children who have taken the time to come and listen and to be equipped and trained. Father, I pray that you will bless what has been discussed, that you will magnify what has been discussed, that you will electrify it in such a way, Father, that a movement will begin in Phoenix using your children that are sitting here. Amen. With their specialties, with their field of interest, with their sphere of influence, Father, I pray that you will bless them, anoint them, and make them vessels and useful tools in establishing meaningful, sustainable relations with the Muslim community that you have providentially brought to our shores. We thank you for what you will do through this magnificent movement and plan. In Jesus' wonderful, we all said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings to you.